going to come back to our uh, uh, chapter five, water embeddings. Uh, we actually started um, reading this chapter last week, but um, we didn't finish and we said, okay, we'll complete it today. And Juan was on our way over there. I said last week. <laughs> I watched the video though. I saw, ah, I saw everything. Oh, oh, sure. Okay, then fine. So um, <laughs> let's recap basically. Um, uh, we said uh, this is a water embedding chapter, and we said uh, there was a pre water embedding era where we have count vector TFID of co occurrence and modern water embedding era where we use um, skip gram and CVAL. And we have seen the disadvantage of these methods, um, these ones, like they create a sparse matrix. And now we, uh, for example, when here we can see this is a kind of sparse matrix. Uh, but uh, the next thing that we'll continue is what you call um, water embedding, which we will continue today. I think we stopped last week, this one here, weighted count TF idea, uh, where we made mention that um, linguists have been working to make sure that uh, this kind of sparsity in these uh, documentary matrices does not contain any kind of uh, semantic, but what is now working on is the call water embeddings. Um, so let's dive in and see what this word embedding is. Um, yeah. So this is um, actually um, a summary. Um, uh, I work, uh, read from JJ uh, Alamas, one of blog posts that uh, is good um, to understanding the word embedding. So word embedding can be uh, created in two ways. Number one is uh, pre-trained vectors and without pre trained vectors, meaning you can create your own word embeddings and use them for your modeling. Uh, but if you have um, specific needs, you can create your own word embedding for your own domain. Uh, so let's look at this word, word embedding. So word embedding, as we already said, are basically a way to represent text data as vectors. Yes, that is it. So even uh, word document matrices, uh, those stuff that we represent them, they are embeddings but they are sparse. So let's look at an example here, an example of globe word vectors. So this is uh, a word vector for the word king. Uh, as we can see here, this uh, word vector. And uh, we want to represent this one and see what they mean, what is their meaning. Uh, these are 50 words. So here we represent um, each, uh, let's color code each cell, if they are close to two, uh, with red, if they are white, if they are close to zero, and this one, and they are represented here. Okay. Uh, and um, now, when we remove this representation and see represent these uh, vectors with such a word with color, then we can see here this is a vector for a king. This is a vector of a man. This is a vector of woman. Now we can see here there is some kind of relationship between this stuff. Uh, you can see here, like a man and woman. You can see they have this. You can see this. Um, in fact, the vector representation looks the same. So this is visual representation of this vector, uh, but for the man, for the king. But we also represent the same thing for the man and the woman. So here you can see this. It really captures some kind of semantic information because all of this one, king, man, woman, they are all people. You can see here they uh, they have the same stuff like that. Uh, but also here you can see this is another representation uh, of the embeddings that they are represented as pictures. You can see queen, woman, girl, boy. You can see in some dimension, for example, here they have the same thing. They have the same thing. So this is telling us that they, there is some, some kind of similarities in this dimension of this vector. And these are some of the few things to note. There is a thread red column throughout these different words. You can see this one here. Why? Because this is queen, woman, girl, but there is some kind of similarity. You can see how woman and girl. So if we look at woman and girl, uh, let's look at them, woman and girl. Um, you can see they have this one here, the same. And you can see um, woman and girl. So there is a lot of uh, similarities. Boy and girl, if you look at it here, boy and girl, uh, they also have the same thing. So, but one of the most famous example of this uh, 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 embedding that the capture mini is this an example where we have the vector for the king here, we have the vector for the man here, and we have the vector for the woman here. Then when we say king minus woman minus man plus woman, it gives us a queen. So you can see here, 
king, man, woman, but when they do it, because these are vectors, then we can subtract them and do many kind of manipulation, right? Because they are vectors world. Now, when we do this, then it gives us, um, this is a queen. So we can see that this kind of representation allow us now to do some kind of, uh, so you can see this is king minus woman plus woman. Uh, this is this one, but this is queen. So you can see queen and this one, there is some kind of similarities, right? Because look at this one. This one, they are here, the same. This one, they are 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 the same. So there are some position where the vectors are the same. So the resulting vector you can see from king and man, they do resemble them, but they are not all equal, but um, they are actually having some kind of uh, intuition that we can say they uh, encode some semantic meaning. So that is generally the idea of um, embedding. Uh, they are just um, vectors, uh, but uh, uh, not sparse vectors, but dense vectors. So this is um, general intuition about uh, what embedding. Anybody, Justin, can you want to add something here? Okay, do you want, you want to add something here? Right. Okay, so let's move on. So um, now we have seen the intuition of um, embeddings. Uh, let's look at how we can uh, create this embeddings by our solve. So we said previously that uh, we can use two ways for embedding. One is we can generate our embeddings. Number two, we can use pre-trained embeddings, which were the kind of embedding that uh, have been used mostly. So. How can we create the embedding? Number one, they said that we will use word counts and matter factorization, um, which they call Moody approach. Uh, the approach basically use um, word count and matter factorization. Uh, in other word embedding approach, like what to bake and globe, they use what we call, uh, what to bake use what we call skip gram and CBAO. Um, so here, this is what they're going to use, but they will also use a skibram. So why do we need to create our own word embedding? It allows the practitioner to find word vector for their own collection. So for example, if you want to use word embedding from what to back or globe, they are general embeddings. They may not contain some kind of specific uh, semantic you may need. For example, if you want to create word embedding for some kind of niche area or some particular domain, then it's better to create your own uh, uh, embeddings and train them and then use for your own application rather than they using the general embeddings. So this is, um, we're gonna use this data set, uh, which is complaint, uh, but I, I, I removed the match part of the data set because it takes much time for me to run. So I just take 1000 lines, um, 1000 complaint. Um, yeah, so this is the data set that we will use it um, to create our own embeddings, right. I, I, I felt like um, maybe uh, the structure of this chapter, if you remember the previous one, like stop words, uh, they started discussing about uh, off the shelf stop word. When they finished work, uh, explaining all the shelf stop word, and now later they talk about um, how you can create your own stop word. But this chapter is a kind of reverse, like the shows how you can create embedding from scratch. Then at the end of the chapter, they show how you can use um, pre-train the, the uh, off-the-shelf embedding. So <laughs> I was thinking like this is reverse; it should be the same. So let's look at how to do that. So the first thing is uh, the concept of what is called skip gram, uh, which the Moody also use. So what does it mean of this? So for example, the, the skip gram algorithm is basically uh, given a word, you try to predict the word context. So for example, if we have a word uh, jump, which is a target word, you will be given the context word, which is a window, um, how many word uh, to predict this kind of. So we can see here, we have a window size of four. So this uh, skip gram algorithm try to do something like this, uh, try to find the context words um, from the uh, available target word. Now, so you can see, Skip gram because it's unsupervised, right? Because yeah, of course it's unsupervised. You just give the word and try ask it to find the context word. So it's one of the unsupervised techniques that you to find most related word, uh, given word. And uh, they are actually good enough in encoding context, uh, skip gram, because uh, unlike um, uh, TF idea, there is no context. Skip gram, they give a context. Uh, 
they don't create a kind of sparse matrix as we have TF idea, uh, they create that. Uh, the reason why what to bed also uh, set the world, we're saying what to bed, uh, the example I gave where we can see where man minus king plus woman give us a queen, that is an example from what to bed uh, embeddings. And the what to bed embedding basically use skip gram models to do that, uh, but also another uh, is called Seval. So, um, so this is skip gram, uh, more or less, but what is Siva? Uh, another algorithm, which is the reverse of skip gram. Um, so you can see here, what to make use skip gram, you will give given a target word and ask to, uh, and predict the context of the word, but skip gram, you'll be given the context. So you will be given this context, jet quick brown fox and this over and ask to predict the word in the middle. That is what is called CBAL. So for example, these are the input, and now you'll be asked to uh, make the predictions in, in this one. So this is um, CBAL, and this is um, uh, a skip gram. So in deep learning approach or yeah, neural network approach, this is the basic idea that can be used to create um, uh, uh, word embeddings. Uh, yeah, but uh, in this uh, way, this uh, what the book presented here, which is um, based on Moody approach, uh, they use Skipgram, um, not Siba, uh, but uh, for generally for us to know, we can use this one. So what Skipgram implementation does. So we can see here from Skipgram implementation, we need a lot of things. Number one, we need the window size, right? We need to find the window size, um, which is four here, and we need to know the target. So we'll use the function, we now need to create um, a kind of function which will find, which will kind of find the, uh, given a window size, we'll find the context word. That is what we're gonna do now. We'll create a function that given the target or uh, given the window size um, and given the target, what are the uh, context word? So we're gonna uh, have a function, uh, which is this, uh, this is a function. Uh, slide window, uh, uh, unfortunately, I have not actually captured a lot of this code. Um, Justin, if you, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, I mean, so slider is basically a kind of functions um, that actually used to, uh, for example, like par, map packet, map, uh, but it's kind of uh, advanced uh, of par, uh, map, but, um, you can give the kind of uh, context, uh, the size you want to move. So this is uh, the, this is what the slider function is doing. So we've provided, given the window size, it starts from one and the step we want to take one and we want to have the complete equals to true. Um, so this basically, this is the windows uh, slide window function. Uh, it's doing a lot of thing here, um, but I don't understand. Actually, I, I tried to follow, but I didn't. Uh, Justin or John, can you help? I was going to ask you the same thing, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> Justin. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I was thinking about making like a little toy example for my own understanding and to share with you all. Um, but uh, I didn't, I, di I didn't do it, but, uh, but yes, I mean, I, the documentation for slide is pretty cool. Um, it's pretty good, but I mean, this, the reason I think this, function is not immediately intelligible is because it's combining nesting, you know, slide, and then you've got mm -hmm. uh, a map to, and mm -hmm. then you've got some per functions down there at the bottom. So it's not like the most easily intuitive uh, right. function, Maybe function I've ever seen. <laughs> Maybe next yeah. week if somebody can walk us through, because like I tried to walk through it, but um, yeah. So basically the main idea I think is, uh, as I said, is trying to uh, create, um, we're trying to create a sliding window here, given a window size here, which is four. So given a window size and the data, you try to find these kind of stuff, uh, the uh, context word, yeah. So that's what the function is doing. Um, so now that we find that all the skip gram windows, we can calculate how often word occur on their own and how often word occur on their own. So this is the first step, right? Sliding window. But now what you need to know, um, find is how often this word occurs near to this, how often this word occurs near to this. So for the next one here, we're gonna use what is called uh, PMI, point to eye mutual information. So it's like uh, a waiting scheme like TF IDF. Of course, we have seen how TF IDF can be used to 
find um, uh, the occurrence of word uh, uh, in a document. But um, uh, PMI also is such kind of waiting scheme because TFID is also waiting scheme, but it's just a baseline. And an example, PMI is much robust than that. So PMI is used for time to time metrics, unlike TFIDF, where, for example, here we have um, maybe uh, uh, kind of books. We have, as you like it, uh, 20 Julius Caesar, Harry, these are books. And here we have words, and we have the representation of this word in the book. And this is TFIDF, right? This is called uh, document, uh, term document matrix. But PMI, PMI use what we call term term matrix. So here is like all the words in a dictionary. For example, we have the dictionary and we have our term. So we can calculate the PMI point to emission information for cherry and this one. So uh, uh, a PMI is term to term matrix uh, that show us the uh, how relevant uh, two words occur. So for example, if you look at this one, Information and computer, you can see the uh, how they occur. Digital and computer, you can see that. Cherry and computer, right? But cherry pie, can you see 442, something like this? So um, we can, we're going to use now point wide mutual information to calculate that. So right, so um, this is uh, one of the computationally um, uh, intensive, it takes a lot of time. So you can see here, this is taking uh, the same kind of word we have here. Um, um, taking our words, uh, what, which words? Ah, okay, this one, nested word. I'm taking this one. And now um, we try to uh, use our sliding window and put the words we want and um, uh, calculate the PRY's PMI um, giving the word and Windows ID. So this um, what calculates the PMI here. And when PMI is high, the two words are associated with each other, right? So you can see here, trying is, this is the PMI. Um, mine is, this is one point this. Uh, A is, A is, you can see it's negative, right? So this PMI is telling you this, they don't really, um, so, something like that. So uh, they like, when PMI is low, the two words are not associated with each other or like, like they are cut. So that is the next second step. Uh, we create something like um, these numbers, uh, which is uh, trying to show us how co how would they co occur. Then the next step is to um, um, reduce the size of this large vector. Uh, to some way uh, which is uh, more, uh, contain more information, which can be done using matrix factorization using SDD. So we can next determine how the word vector from PMI value using singular, but, uh, singular value decomposition, uh, which is basically one of the method of uh, dimensionality reduction uh, via matrix factorization. Uh, so we can see here that um, we're gonna use the SDD uh, which using this function from uh, TIDR, which is using widely YD, SVD. And what we can provide with this is the terms, uh, I, uh, the thing that we want to calculate, uh, find the SVD, uh, which is item one, item two, and PMI from here. We have item one, item two, and we want to calculate the um, SVD. And uh, after calculating the SVD, we can see this is what we have now. So you can see here, uh, the SVD now bring down this document from 108112 rows, 108112. Um, it bring it down to like 52,390. So what is telling us that now SVD, what it does, it does what you call dimensionality reduction, and it takes the useful dimensions and discard other dimensions that are not quite useful. For example, uh, this uh, maybe it discard this one that they do not correlate, um, discard this one, right? Maybe they don't occur open, and this one they don't occur open, then SVD will not pick them. So that is uh, what SVD. Now, we now have successfully found word embeddings. Uh, why? Because we actually PMI calculate the 
co-occurrence and importance uh, like this is negative, like this is negative. And now the next step is to remove this negative, those ones that they do not occur. And that is the purpose where we use SVD here. And the SVD um, remove, do what we call dimensionality reduction, uh, which uh, will basically remove those that they don't actually maybe uh, contribute much information. And uh, we now have this. So this is our word embedding. So the real benefit of this approach is based on counting. We can see we do counting, uh, dividing, and matrix decomposition. So it involves three steps, this approach. Uh, the first one is counting, right, where we have seen. The second is dividing, uh, where we use PMI. And the last one is matrix decomposition. So, right, so this is uh, training word embedding from ourselves. Um, anyone want to add something, John, Justin? All right, okay, so. Okay, so now we have created word embeddings. This section is talking about um, how we can explore them, see what they mean. Um, right, so let's look at that. So one thing that we want to uh, explore them is we want to try to find the nearest words given a particular word. So we're going to use this function called uh, nearest neighbor. Uh, the honest neighbors, right? Um, given a DF data frame and we give a token, it will try to find the uh, nearest word. Um, and again, Justin, uh, I'm, <laughs> this one is, I'm not yet, uh, I'm not quite grasped it. Um, Justin, can you explain if you, <laughs> or Joan, you have anything to add? Um, actually, uh, um, this uh, matrix or some stuff is, I didn't quite get it. Um, I think it's taking dot products in okay. some part of it. So that's how you're getting um, proximity. That's the only thing I can mm -hmm. decipher right. mm -hmm. immediately. Right. But um, nearest word, um, if you want to, we, we use basically cosine, right? Um, is it cosine similarity, right? Is that, that is the basic things we do. Is that correct? That's that's one way. I mean, there are two ways. There's cosine oh. similarity, and then there's the dot product. And on the line oh. that's res, that's assigning the something's calculation to res, that's taking a dot product between uh, uh, everything, I guess, the data frame and y. Yeah. So that's that's the the pairwise. Uh, anyway, that's the, um, and then divided by the magnitude of the two. Anyway, so that's that's the only thing that I see that's going on there. Otherwise yeah. it's- Because, yeah, uh, why I was confused previously, he said uh, it used um, it used matrix multiplication and some to calculate the post sign similarity between the word. Um, so uh, he, he made mention cosine similarity here, um, but I didn't see where he take the cosine, they take the cosine. Um, Yeah, so um, just um, looking at it, um, the function. John, can you can you chip in? <laughs> okay, so um, basically, um, the function does is try to find the neighbors um, uh, given a particular word, uh, which is an example here, uh, using the function. Uh, yeah, uh, given the word error, and we can see it tries to uh, find some kind of uh, uh, so this one might not be the same as the what is in the book because like um, I basically just subset some section of the uh, data so it's not complete the use the example in the data uh, in the book so this may not actually be close to ideal because one of this advantage of this method is that you need to have large amount of data for it to work right but. Uh, uh, I, I, I mean, it, it's hooking my computer. So I just have said uh, some parts. So that's why this one does not actually look um, somehow close. Uh, we can also see month here, um, but looking at the month here, you can see it captures some kind of semantic, right? 
year day right uh, monthly months and you can see here uh it even capture like um month and monthly and this even they are they are not being stemmed uh so just in this word have not been stemmed but the algorithm try to understand the relate to one another right we didn't not stem this text but the word embedded line that month month and monthly belongs together so this is actually interesting to see that um it can capture this stuff uh if, in fact they even said that um, uh, 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 what embedding can be used to do stemming? Um, yeah. Um, so with this kind one of thing, things, one one thing that I I remember being confused about when I read this is that so it tries to understand it being the the algorithm tries to understand semantics from proximity and saying that proximate things are more related. But mm -hmm. one thing I was thinking about is. I, I mean, I would have to just look at a lot of text or, or I don't know what I would have to do to correct this intuition, but I feel like the words month, monthly and months probably actually don't normally occur close to each other because that would be a very strange text. Like for this month, we spent our monthly ah, ah, okay. amount just as in other months, like no one would write that. So to me, that's one of the, that's kind of a mystery here ah. is like, um okay. it seems like it shouldn't okay. be doing that but it is and i'm not saying it, it's just kind of an intuition gap i have right so for example the idea i think um i don't know if this, so for example if i said um i paid monthly rent i paid monthly rent right and now i said uh uh i paid two months rent two months rent rent and now I said, uh, uh, I will pay my next month rent. So you can see the context here, this um, context word, um, they kind of have some kind of similar intuitions because you are talking, I will pay rent, uh, monthly rent, because these three sentences look somehow similar. So the words, that appears in this one, the kind of contextualize it. They are look, they look similar. They are not the same, but they look similar because you, you see the vector, because each word is a vector. And this inside this vector, it corresponds to multiple information, not only for that word, but for multiple information, even close, close words that resemble it. That is the essence here we saw. I think I would. Uh, maybe if you don't, uh, you have not seen that blog post that um, uh, uh, JJ Alma. So let me show you this. No, um, uh, where can I go back? I think on the oh. table of contents. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at this one here, king, man, woman, they are not saying they are the same, right? But what they are saying is that this is a vector, right? This is a vector for the king. This is a vector for the man. This is a vector for the woman. But they do have some kind of commonality in them. So for example, here, you can see this one here. They have the, the vector uh, The vector here. They, they have the same value in the vector because this representation, you know, is a, uh, is a value, right? They have the same representation here. And you, you can see here, uh, okay, let me see for man and woman, right? Here, they have the same representation. Here, they have the same representation. They have the same representation. So, all, so this is not telling you that the king and man, they are the same, or man and woman, they are the same, but they have some kind of contextual semantic because I can say the man has gone to the supermarket. The woman has gone to the supermarket. The king has gone to the supermarket. So you can see like they have them because man is somebody that goes, that work. Woman is somebody that work and go to buy and king, maybe king doesn't go to the woman, you know? So this kind of semantic around it, that is how it captured the meanings. It's not like um, they are the same, but it captures some. So for example, as I give an example, I pay my rent last month. I pay rent monthly. I will pay my next week, next two months rent. So you can see they are having some kind of contextual uh, meaning together. So this, the, their vectors may contain some similarity in, along some axis. 
not all. So that's how it incorporates the, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think I understand that. I mean, no, I think I, I'm pretty sure I understand that theoretically. My point is just from the algorithm's point of view. Ah, <laughs> okay. Like, I don't see how it could know that given that I don't imagine that month, monthly and months uh -huh. would ever co-occur. But now thinking about it, I guess they would occur with words like rent, like rent in the frame of around rent, you would see month, monthly, months, and there you could, uh, and then just somehow in singular value decomposition, it all works out. But but now, now I'm thinking about another problem, and that's when you put mm -hmm. in similarity with month. Uh, a bunch of other words come up before months, when if I'm thinking about it, really the similarity between month and months should be like 0.99 because the only difference mm -hmm. is that one is plural. Mm. I mean, that's the only dim dimension, yeah. you know? So if we have a hundred dimensional representation of the word of our words, uh, mm -hmm. month and months should just be like identical on 99 of them, except for our plural mm -hmm. marker. Mm -hmm. So that's one of, I mean, not that that's exactly the, that a hundred dimensional word representation is gonna have plural marker as like one of its dimensions, but it should be something like that intuitively. Yeah. So, I think also, so now I, I have another. Now, now. now I have two. Now <laughs> I have two intuitions. Okay. I, Juan. Yeah. Yeah, like th that's confusing now. Um, because when Shan was going through the king example uh, just now, like I was thinking, okay, months and monthly, like all those words show the similar vectors, but now with Justin saying. That is not the case, right? Because it should be identical, close to. Sorry, I'm really confused now. So yeah, so Sean, if you go to your the nearest name, ah. so I think just scroll down a little bit on that page, you'll see when you see the nearest neighbors for month. So I think it's a little bit up. So if you look, yeah. just if these vectors are really encoding semantic meaning, it seems like entries eight and nine monthly and months should be well like above 0.9. should be above yes and then also above point uh, sorry above agreed and well like uh, whatever monthly means it is closer in meaning to month than agreed oh sorry for right? my yeah as i said i think in the book that's what it is yeah um juan can we can you check the book because yeah, i say sure. um i always um get some part of the word um, can you see? uh scroll to the some part john justin yeah, as yeah, i said th that's my problem because i only subset some part of the text not the whole text that give us maybe this wrong representation um it's 0.59 <laughs> so not that much better well it's a little better yeah so months is 0.59 and monthly is 0.45 you know it's okay so it's a little higher than what you have there, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, as I said, this is one of the problem with this approach, right? Uh, it's not like um, you need to have a large amount of data. So uh, you, you see word embeddings, um, they have been turned a billion of text size, billion size, right? Like a uh, globe and fax and stuff like that. So if you have like a text of billions of size, maybe the uh, such kind of uh, co-occurrence, I think, may increase. What do you think, Justin? Yeah, so I I just went to the the book as well, and so yeah, the the similarity scores still seem kind of low, but at least they're above words that are not. <laughs> so I mean, the vector does go month, year, months, monthly, mm. and so that's at least comforting. <laughs> so although you know, but it's not like I'm from. Um, I, I don't know exactly what to expect as far as cosine similarity scores. Like, uh, it's not like a unit I'm, I'm uh, dealing with consciously every day. So, you know, anyway, but at least like the ordinal result is comforting when you have a lot of data. Kind of. And then there's just right. randomly 85 down as entry number nine. So I don't know. Um, but uh, but yes, this does take a long time. You know, I I in I started preparing to attend this like an hour before we uh, met, and I just I just wanted to see if I could run the tidy PMI 
or the pairwise <laughs> PMI yeah. function on, on one year of the data. Because I at first I tried to do two years, my computer crashed. Oh, last week. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I this, this week I tried to just do one year, 2021, and it's been oh. running for the last two hours now. Oh, yeah. So I'm now I'm opposed to pairwise mutual information. I don't like it. <laughs> okay, good one. So yeah, so there's something like with fee and fees, you can see them. So um, yeah, so, so the top words are fee and fees, word embedding can learn that singular and plural form of what are related and belong to either. In fact, word embedding can include many of the same goals of tax like statement, but more reliably and less arbitrarily. So Justin, what can you say that? What can you say? Because they said like um, more reliably, how can word embedding can do that? Because is it not um, rule-based or what? I guess, yeah. I think that's, okay. that's it. Although, uh, because STEM is literally, right? It just can't chop, cut. Yeah, but if I remember right, the, the main um, downside we talked about with stimming was that um, words that aren't actually semantically related will get mm -hmm. chopped down to something and made indistinct and then counted as the same. But uh, this seems like it would happen here too. Um, like it doesn't recognize two different senses mm. of of fee, although that's that's a different problem. Charge uh, and charges. Like yeah, so I mean, I guess I'm thinking about like uh, no, I'm thinking about a different problem about um, homon yeah homonyms. That's the problem I'm thinking about. Uh, yeah, no, I guess. I mean, it, okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it does put fee and fees together, which is, I mean, that is what stimming does. Stimming yeah. just makes it, stimming would make their cosine similarity one instead of 0.3 something, 3.9. I don't know. I don't have any All big right. thoughts. Okay. So um, that's how we explore um, word embeddings. Uh, but how can we use them in modeling? Um, so if you want to do sentiment analysis, or if you want to do um, aggregation stuff or like that, so how do we use this vector representation modeling? The classic and simplest approach is to treat each document as a collection of words and summarize the word embedding into document embedding either using mean or sum. So this is how we can do it. Um, just uh, treat each uh, document as a collection. So this is an example of the tidy complaint data and we uh, count these and cast this stuff into uh, kind of a sparse matrix. And we can see this is the, our data set, um, which is in some way matrix representation. And this is the dimension, which 1000 document and 524 features. So this is our uh, tidy data. And we want to see, and this is our also embedding that we just created uh, tidy word vectors. And we cast it also to uh, matrix. And this is the dimension of that. Um, because it's exactly uh, small, <laughs> my word. Uh, so now how can you do that? So here they do basically a matrix uh, multiplication and add them. So I'm really not sure here. So um, here we have our document, um, which we cast into a matrix. And here we have the embeddings, we cast into the matrix as well. But here we count and find the sum here. And so here, the, this is matrix multiplication, right? Um, doing this will give us this representation. And now this is our, uh, uh, this is our uh, future matrix or something like that. So for example, previously, this is our, for the data set we have, and we have one thousand document and we have 524 features, but um, we want to use word embedding. So what we can do is to cast the word embedding also as a form of matrix and we can do multiplication. And now, now we have this uh, 1000 and this, we select only the embeddings. So now we can use this as a modeling step. What I do not really understand is this multiplication. So multiplying the word matrix and the embedding matrix, it gives us um, another matrix we can, which we can cast it back to data frame. But 
does anybody has the intuition? Um, so I believe if we do matrix multiplication, this is a symbol so for multiplication. If we do matrix multiplication, um, what does that give us? Um, I'm not sure why they do multiplication and consider the resultant of the multiplication as our the gold standard that we take and go and do our modeling stuff. Does anybody have that info, uh, intuition? So um, if not, um, this is what I understand that um, for you to do, uh, uh, to do embedding in modeling, uh, we just take um, our document, we cast it into DF, uh, uh, we already know this where we, in our tidy text, and we also take um, the embedding matrix, which is embedding vectors we created, and cast it also to uh, uh, dimension, cast it into a uh, 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 matrix as well, and now take this multiplication, and this, the resultant one, is a, so here, here we have a new matrix here that we can use as our input for our modeling. So in our word embedded uh, uh, of a high quality, this translation of the high dimension of a word to the lower dimension. So doing this, the problem is that if we have our data, we can see it has high dimension, right? Maybe our futures, maybe, maybe 3000 or something like that, but casting into this one will bring down the dimension to low dimension. And if you are worried embedded of, of high quality, then you can take the advantage of semantic uh, meaning that capture in the embedding. Uh, yeah, so this is um, how this session. Any question or anyone to add something? Do you want anything you want to add? Okay. So last thing just, is- just, just real quick, sorry, I, I was a bit slow thinking about this. So you did reduce your sparse matrix, right? You yeah, went exactly. From exactly. One thousand. Uh -huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so you reduced it by four hundred and twenty-four dimensions. That's not bad. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So using pre-trained word embedding. So in NLP, using pre-trained word embedding. This is the word, um using. This is what. Uh, were using people who are using and even is paired many other models like VAT and stuff like that. Uh, so you can see the previous way for us to create our embeddings, you need large amount of data. But if your data is too small, you can use the pre-trained embeddings, uh, which are trained on very large uh, stuff, uh, like what embedding are trained on Google News data set, globe embedding and, and pasted embedding are learned from Wikipedia plus other sources. So we have this kind of embedding, glove, word to bake, and fast test. I think these are the most widely used pre-trained embeddings, and they actually uh, capture a lot of semantic meaning. And these embeddings, they have been implemented in many are like glove in text to bake, word to bake in word to bake R package, fast test is implemented in fast test R package. So this is uh, these are some of the pre-trained embeddings. So this is an example of what to bake uh, from the package called what to bake. Uh, so here we use um, uh, data from uh, from Udu Pipe, uh, Brussels reviews, and in German, and uh, we um, subset the data. Uh, uh, can see the language uh, we say you know. Um, so here we take the data and we do some kind of pre-processing. We just lower the data, right? So we have now our data is Excel. And now here we load the word to bake um, uh, library, and now we create the model here. You can see here you can specify the kind of model. As I said, word to bake use two kind of model: skipgram and cval. So here you can say, okay, use cval, the dimension and the number of iteration we want to use, and this is the data. And you can see we pre do kind of embedding and say predict and predict. We give the model and say, okay, give us looks alike. So here we can see we have a bus here, and now the term to like tram. You know, band. I don't know why bus and fifteen comes like a high similarity, but you can see bus and tram they have high similarity and stuff like that. So you can see this one is toilet. Um, this are kind of German. Can you see? It's not like English. So it can give. By the way, just just all of our our German viewers don't get upset. This is actually Dutch. Just so, I just I just don't want. Sorry. So I said. <laughs> 
just so that all of our German viewers don't get upset with us. This is actually Dutch. So that I don't ah. know. At the NL parameter? Yeah. That might have been Netherlands. Yeah, that's Netherlands. Oh, Netherlands. Netherlands. Ah. I mean, the, <laughs> the, world, the, the, world, the world would be simpler if they spoke German in the Netherlands, but they don't, for better, for better or worse. But one thing that, um, while I'm saying that irrelevant thing, one thing that's interesting to note that is relevant to what we're talking about is that those similarity scores are so much higher oh, than, yeah. uh, than what mm. was, was even in the book. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of nice in, I guess, some ways that like bus and tram are so similar, but it's very weird that bus and 15 are so similar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I do not think that, you so, know, Bus yeah, and so, 15 are that related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one way, um, uh, one thing is to how you cannot use um embeddings, just go and do them. Sometimes you need to man in the woman, man in the loop, do they call it a uh, human in the loop? Sometimes you know, try to see whether uh, things make sense or not. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um so basically this is just an example. Um, oh, uh, I say German Netherlands. Um uh, uh, doing um, for what to bake. Uh, yeah, so in the book, they use uh, glove with, from text data, but um, I, I think I try to download the um, glove, um, glove stuff, but it doesn't work. It gives me a lot of issues. Uh, I don't know if anybody, um, it works from your end, but from my own end, it doesn't work. Um, yeah, um, the last one is fairness and word embedding. So you can see um, word embedding uh, has projected some kind of uh, systematic bias on unfairness. So uh, what is um, unfairness or bias if it is already created in a data set, then your word embedding can also take such kind of bias. So for example, women's first name are associated with family and men's first name are associated with career. So this is actually some kind of bias. Terms associated with women are more associated with art and terms associated with men are more associated with science. So we can see um, uh, they are accusing the word embedding. I mean, it's just algorithm. So whatsoever you give it, it just gives you the uh, kind of similarities. So what they are saying is like, um, you need to be careful when you're gonna use your word embedding for uh, as in modeling because it may take some kind of bias and uh, it's not fair. Um, yeah, anyway, do you want to add anything? Yeah, that section was, uh, I mean, important, but also interesting because they mentioned, uh, I forget who, because I read this a week ago and I'm bad at remembering surnames, um, but um, there was a researcher who used this, this and what you're talking about um, that, you know, you can kind of, pick up uh, biases from texts, actually study the history of, mm -hmm. of various biases and like looking at the different word associations and embeddings over the course mm -hmm. of history. And I thought that was like mm -hmm. a really interesting research project. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the next one, which is the last, I guess, um, using word embed in the real world. So how can you use embed in the real world? Uh, we have seen some of the, of the challenges of the embedder, right? Um, fairness and stuff like that, um, bias. So can we just go and use them? So consider not using word embedding, as he said the other. <laughs> um, use TF idea if it, it works for you. Um, or uh, uh, n-grams, uh, frequency stuff, maybe quite appropriate for your own use case. Um, but if... Uh, for example, if you are also working on some specific domain, for example, niche domain, um, medical or some stuff like that, you may not necessarily use uh, pre-trained word embeddings. Um, uh, or, yeah, you can create your own embeddings, uh, which may be better than pre-trained ones. Uh, there are also a lot of discussion and method on how we can devise um, this embedding. Uh, for example, removing stereotype by pre-processing pre, pre word vectors. So uh, pre word vectors, um, you remove some kind of bias before using them. This uh, is one of way to do that. All right, so I think this is all I have for this chapter.
Um, yeah, that was really tough, this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's really tough. Um, a lot of stuff in it. So I think- Are you gonna have... use word embedding, Sham, in your research? Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> but pretty train word embeddings and just use them. Uh, yeah. Did you talk about your research paper, by the way, last week? I wasn't here. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I read it. Oh, you read it? Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Um, maybe one of these days, maybe, oh, um, uh, maybe at one of our session, if we finish early, maybe I can talk about it. So just in this one paper that uh, I, I work on, um, we talked with John already. Um, on sentiment analysis because he's also working on sentiment analysis, uh, John. Uh, so we discussed previously and uh, the paper uh, is related to sentiment analysis. And uh, I shared the paper in the channel. It did win, win, what is the name of the channel in the group? <laughs> is it win or something wins like and that? Feedback, yeah, wins and feedback. So John was saying, oh, he saw it and he even read the paper. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. I, I haven't. I guess I'm just too negative of a person. I don't often go into wins and feedback. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, right. Congratula congratulations for having something to post inside wins and feedback. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So um, thank you very much. Uh, so I guess um, next week we're gonna have Justin. I'm gonna give us a... Uh... Is it me? I think it's not me. I mean, I can oh. do it if it is me. Oh, it's not uh, you. I think it's I, Lila. I think it's, I think it's Lila, but I could be ah. wrong. And if oh. I am wrong, I'm glad I'm finding out right now. <laughs> okay. We can resolve this in the Slack, though. Okay. Right. So, um, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, we have available chapters, John. If you are available, you can sign up. Um, so I think uh, thank you, Justin, for contribution and also thank you John for the contribution. This, I really appreciate that. And we we'll see you next week. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.